Hello everyone, welcome to the first AATS Graham Foundation Surgical Robotics Fellowship webinar. Uh, my name is Keely Meredith and I am the project coordinator for the ATS Graham Foundation and we are very excited to have this opportunity with Intuitive to be kicking off this fantastic program and we're very excited to hear about how our three fellows have grown and progressed since uh, their fellowship earlier this summer. Please welcome not only our three fellows, but also Dr. Serfolio in leading and kicking off this webinar. I want to congratulate all our fellows, residents. I want to thank Kaylee, the AATS, and the Graham Foundation. And I'm going to start off by introducing our first fellow. It's interesting that all three are women. So gentlemen, you dropped the ball. I'm very disappointed in you. In any event, let's start off with uh, Aaron Gillespie. Apparently, you're going to go first. And you're going to show us a left lower lobe. It's all yeah. yours, Erin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you to Dr. Serfolio. Um, I guess let's go ahead and get the slides up and going. Um, and I do have to uh, take a moment to say a special thank you to my mentor, Dr. Weigel. Um, so in the last six months uh, at Mayo, we have done 22 cases, robotic cases in thoracic surgery specifically. Um, my cases that I've done since completing the ATS Graham Foundation robotic um, scholarship are right lower lobectomy, left lower lobectomy, nissen fundoplication, esophagectomy, and a couple mitral valve repairs uh, since I'm currently rotating on the cardiac services. Uh, this is a photo and would you of tell us, have you been the... Have you been the primary surgeon on those, most of uh, those? Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Weigel has been absolutely wonderful in letting me spend the entire time at the console coming in and, and coaching me through. Uh, so it's been, it's been a tremendous experience. Uh, this, this photo here shows our general port placement. Uh, you can see that this is actually the right side of the patient. I'll be showing you a left side for the surgery, but, but kind of same, same uh, thing applies to both sides. Our anterior most port is in the inframammary fold or in the pectoral crease. In the anterior axillary line, we generally go in the eighth to ninth intercostal space. Uh, in the mid axillary line, we usually drop down to the ninth or tenth, and posteriorly, we're back in the eighth again. We place our four ports equally spaced about a fist apart to make sure that um, all of the uh, arms can work without interfering with one another. Then we dock our camera first, insert our instruments, um, and, and uh, get the case going. And this is what we look like when we're, we're docked and starting our case. So let's go ahead and go to the video. This patient had a, a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma of the left lower lobe. Um, you know, since I'm newer to the robot, I've been trying to pick cases for myself that are a little bit more straightforward. Um, I've been picking tumors, you know, that are five centimeters or less, trying to choose cases that have good anatomy. Um, I've been trying to avoid uh, um, a lot of previous lung surgery, pneumonias. This patient actually had recurrent pneumonia, so I broke, broke my rule a little bit on this one. Um, as you can no, see, there that, are... That, that's fine. And yeah. Let me ask you a quick question. You see all the smoke in there? Are you using a SurgiQuest system? It doesn't look like you're using the SurgiQuest. We were not, no, no. But I, I, I got to say, even, even without having that, using the robot to take down these adhesions, it's just such a treat. I mean, you have such great visualization throughout. Um, you know, if there's tiny bleeders along the wall, you're easily able to address those as you go. Um, I'm using in my left hand a double fenestrated grasper uh, to provide myself some traction. In my other hand, I'm using the spatula. It's one of the uh, cautery devices we can use. You can see a little tiny bit of bleeding. Address it right away so it doesn't, uh, doesn't perturb you for the rest of the case. Um, so even and I, though I, I just make my a rule, point it that easy. No, you didn't. You didn't break a rule. Your, your rule is when you, you can't. You can't know that going in. So adhesions and these adhesions are so friendly. It's fine. I oh, would yeah. say if you want to save two hundred dollars, and if you're going to use a bipolar at some point during the case, which I bet you you do, you can use a bipolar for this part. And actually, with time, you'll get just as good with the bipolar as you can. And you can put that stick away and never look at it again. But go ahead. <laughs> You know, I, I haven't gotten as, as comfortable with the bipolar right off the bat. It's definitely something that I'd like to add to my armamentarium, though. 
Um, I started taking up, as you can see here, the inferior pulmonary ligament. Again, I'm using my double fenestrated grasper in my left hand to provide myself some tension so that I can see. Um, using, again, my, my spatula and my right arm to be able to uh, dissect out. The patient had pretty thick um, mediastinal pleura, so I really just took my time here to make sure that uh, I could get good visualization of the, the vein um, before, before using um, uh, Let me make a point here. It doesn't look like you're using your third arm at all. I mean, the third arm should be holding that lung up there, and then robotic arm two and one should be operating. You look like a VAT surgeon right now, where <laughs> one hand is retracting and the other hand's operating, and that's so we'll, not the way to do it. Believe it or not, my, my third arm is actually up just out of the screen, holding up part of the, the lobe. Perhaps not ideally, but, but it is over there. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the teaching points is to continually change that third arm. I mean, just like you would a medical student there. And always change it so it's always doing what two should do. Otherwise, you look just like a VAT surgeon, and that's just not efficient at that point. But okay. Sure, sure. Now you'll see me do kind of something funny here. I got around the vein. I actually used my left instrument to do that, but I decided I wanted to bring the stapler through the right. So I put my fenestrated grasper on the right side through again to make sure I had a good angle. Um, I think one of the important things to note, too, the elbow on the, the robotic stapler here is a little bit longer, and that's why it's so important to make sure you really have that, that um, uh, mid-axillary or the posterior port down lower to really give yourself enough room to, to use that effectively. But it's a, a really nice stapling device. I agree. And the next question would be taking the vein so early in the case when you're insufflating CO2. We've seen some congestion and increased bleeding so we usually don't like to take the vein till actually the second to fourth last second to third or fourth last part of the operation you have any comments yeah. on taking the vein so early Absolutely, and actually you will see the lung does get quite congested here, so I wish I hadn't taken it until later because it does become boggy and a little bit more difficult to manage, but as you can see, this is kind of a dream fissure. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. get any nicer than this, and so we thought that we'd be able to get through it pretty quickly even taking the vein so early. Um, again, you can't see here, but my third arm is actually providing traction on the upper lobe. Um, in my left hand now, uh, just before, I actually had the Marilyn, which can also be used as a bipolar device, as Dr. Serfolio mentioned earlier, there's some great bipolar um, energy devices that can be used. Um, I decided to take my basilar and my superior segmental branches separately here, again, using my double finister to gas grasper to easily get around um, each one. I use the robotic stapler, and then um, actually because my superior segmental branch was a little on the smaller side, I used I had my, my bedside assistant use a regular stapling device for that. That's Maybe a very other. interesting point, and I, I agree with you. I think the robotic stapler can be a little big, and for smaller branches, yeah. I actually think it's safer to use either the ski tip Covidian, are you here, or the new Ethicon ski tip uh, eight, 8 millimeter. Yeah, but it was, you know, it's, it's, we have great bedside assistants, so they're e easily able to, to take care of that, um, um, you know, quickly to allow us to proceed on with the case. You know, the other thing that I always um, like to mention, too, it's kind of funny because one, one complaint that people always have about the robot is there's no haptic feedback, but you get so used to seeing the visual cues, spending time with the robot, that you develop kind of visual haptic feedback. So I never have found that I'm putting excessive, uh, excessive tension on any of the vessels. I haven't torn the lung parenchyma or ever really had any issues uh, with that. No, no, I agree, and you've been using that for open cases. The people who say that really don't think about what they're doing open. Yeah. Every time you're doing an open case, you'll tell a resident or medical student, hey, you're pulling too hard, and yeah. the instrument's not in your hand, it's in their hand. Oh, why are yeah, you, you can, going through that this vessel? Is, this is my little surprise. This is an aberrant branch of the pulmonary artery that we actually didn't appreciate on the pre-op CT scan. Um, but as you can see, even if you get into a little bit of bleeding trouble, you can control it very quickly, very easily, grabbed it with a double fenestrated grasper. My assistant put clips on either side of it. We lost minimal blood. You can see we didn't even have to use a suction device. Uh, and then I used the vessel why, sealer. Why do you say that's it. apparent? That's going to the right middle lobe. Isn't that going to the right middle lobe there? We're Where on, are you we're right on the left now? side. This is the left lower lobe. And, and no, it was actually Sorry, an yeah, aberrant yeah. vessel. We were just taking the anterior fissure. And it was an aberrant vessel traveling through the anterior fissure to the lower lobe. 
Um, it was a surprise, but um, we very easily handled it, uh, got control very quickly, and we were able to, to go on with the case without, without too much excitement. So it was great learning for me. But I'd say it's common to see a branch going to the lingula, as I said right middle of going to the lingula from that basal or part. That, that, that's mm -hmm. common. So I use the word aberrant. It's not that aberrant. It's, it's pretty common. Yeah. So you go through that anterior fissure, you like to go in between the two veins and really identify and staple that whole thing because there's commonly a little. Yeah. Now we're back to a unipolar. Why don't you use the bipolar there? <laughs> You know, uh, it's it's the way that we kind of have have always done it. Um, so we've kind of gotten in the habit of using that. But, but like I mentioned, I think you know, adding adding uh, a bipolar to the armamentarium will be something I will definitely be doing over my next. How do you months. like the vessel sealer? Tell us about your experience with that. I love it. I think it's great. Actually, we use it. Um, as you can see, you know, kind of clearing off the area around the bronchus. But I also use it sometimes taking out the fissure. You can see me here taking the uh, bronchus. I, you know, I'm still new, so I am having my anesthesiologist give me a couple puffs to make sure that I'm not um, in any way affecting the lingula or the upper lobe. You know, the, the I idea is just to get a couple of alveoli to inflate, not reinflate the whole upper lobe, because then it can be a little bit unmanageable and, and kind of get in your view. So this is kind of the maximum uh, inflation we usually ask for. I know a lot of people don't do that. Um, as, as they become a lot more confident and experienced, but for me it's an extra safety check um, while I'm still in, in my learning phase. Uh, and then actually you can see me here taking the posterior fissure with, um, with the vessel sealer, which again I love. You know, I haven't had any issues with air leaks uh, using that, especially in these, in these uh, thin fissures. Um, you can see, as, as Dr. Cerfolio mentioned, you know, taking that vein early and, uh, you know, the lung does look quite boggy and so it is a little bit bigger uh, removing it. Uh, from the chest, but you can see us putting it in. Uh, uh, I I think it's an important. Yeah, but we were able to get it in our specimen bag, no problem. It's an important just, teaching point to take the vein last. Yeah. yeah. And you then take the vein last, you won't have that, and if you start dealing with bigger tumors, sure, not as many issues. Um, and we just put it in our bag. We just increased the size of uh, one of our ports to be able to remove the specimen. Usually one of the posterior ones, we put a chest tube through the anterior most port. And then I just wanted to show a quick picture of our little Raytech too. I, I throw a couple of these in at the beginning of the case and use them to dab uh, if I need improved visualization. That way I don't need an extra utility port to, to ask my bedside assistant to uh, suction or anything. It's just uh, one extra way to be able to help yourself during the case. Uh, and that's my video, so we can head back to the slides. Um, of course, I should mention we did do. Well, a that's great. Lymphatic that's great. Actually, uh, no more. Yeah, you didn't show that, and that was my next question. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen all your fives and sixes and everything else, but okay. Yeah, we, um, you know, we we took all, all the right. Well, that was very good, Aaron. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yep. Let's let's move on. Let's let's move on. Congratulations. All right, our next presenter is going to be from Brigham and Women's. It's going to be Gita Moody, who's going to show us actually an esophagectomy. So we're changing gears. Gita, can you hear us? Yes, Dr. Cifolio, thank you. Thank you. Proceed. All right, so I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Wee. I think he's listening in and I'd uh, like to tell you about the thoracic surgery service experience uh, with robotic cases. Last year, uh, the thoracic service did 35 uh, total cases. You can see the breakdown there. I was a first year fellow and I did one case. It was a bedside case. I was called in to assist, um, uh, but I had very little experience with the robot. Uh, this academic year, um, we're on a similar trajectory, probably doing a few more cases, uh, two surgeons um, doing them routinely now, and I have completed 16 <coughs> cases. Uh, three were at bedside and 13 were at the console and a, a variety, mostly lung resections. Uh, I'd like to describe an uh, Ivor Lewis esophagectomy we did. We had a patient who had um, previous abdominal surgery. She had a T3N0 distal esophageal cancer. She underwent um, neoadjuvant therapy, already had a lap. Oh, you don't, don't you, you, you skip all that. Just tell us you did the belly part. We see it. Let's get on to the video. Yeah. 
So then, so we positioned um, after leaving a Penrose drain around the uh, conduit stapled, uh, sutured, sorry, to the um, specimen, uh, we positioned for the robotic portion of the case. So she's in left lateral decubitus. You see our port placement here, uh, roughly eight centimeters apart, and we have one um, five uh, posteriorly. So it's interesting you don't tilt the patient and make them more prone. We put them in an almost prone position and tilt the patient and then the table so they look like a lateral decube. So anesthesia leaves you alone, but they're essentially prone. I would, I would try that on your next one. Big advantage. Go ahead. All right. So we'll go on to the video. So as you see, we have the um, uh, thoracic grasper and a, actually a bipolar uh, forceps, the fenestrated forceps, uh, to do most of the dissection. Arm 3 is holding the lung out of the way. I uh, understand what you're saying, Dr. Stifolio, if we were um, prone, maybe this would fall forward. Um, we right. grab that Penrose drain that had been tucked in at the hiatus and use it to provide retraction of the esophagus as we uh, mobilize the intrathoracic um, portion, um, taking down the pleural attachments um, from the hiatus all the way up to um, the end. Now, of one thing um, you could do there is have your assistant bring in an instrument, and they could grab the Penrose, and then you could operate like an actual surgeon with two hands and not like a VAT surgeon with one hand. Again, I, I encourage you all to start using all three hands actively. So robotic arm three should have moved two or three times by now, or have robotic arm three hold the Penrose up, and use one and two to operate just like you would open. That's the big advantage to the robot. But go ahead, you're doing a good job. Okay, so I guess you're suggesting that we have someone uh, bring in a Snowden or something from the assist port and be do, pulling this Penrose yeah. forward. Well, look, 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 look how you're operating. Yeah. You're operating with one hand, and it's not a one hand. I don't, I don't do anything with one hand. should be using three sure. or at least two. This whole operation right. so far is being done with one hand. Go ahead. Good point. We're taking the, the attachments off the, the pericardium as we move up. Um, I think we're actually in the other plural space here, uh, which is fine. We left a chest drain mm -hmm. on the other side. Um, and uh, you're right, we're getting a, um, slowing down a little bit here just because we need to provide a, a little bit more retraction. But I find these bipolar forceps to be very useful um, uh, for doing this part of the dissection and um, uh, we just moved up here towards the azagus, switched over to the spatula, as you see. Um, but we'll divide this in the next uh, few uh, video clips, which is uh, routine when we do uh, esophagectomy. Um, uh, when you take your you azagus, do you, do you make a point to take the azagus posteriorly so it doesn't flop in your way during the anastomosis? Do you do that? I think that's important. Yes, and, and here we are using the, um, the bedside assistant to bring in the, the stapler, um, which will uh, be in the next few clips. We aren't using the um, robotic stapler routinely. Well, you're using an SI, and she and Aaron had an XI, so it's two totally different platforms. Your, your robot's an SI, okay? Right. Yep. So um, after uh, the division of the azagus, we'll show you uh, taking off. Uh, the esophagus from the airway, as well as a few other um, features there. Um, uh, I think there's probably um, several important points here as to some of the surgeons try to preserve the azagus, uh, the others um, keep the azagus, uh, divide the azagus routinely, um, but uh, I think we have a pretty good outcome either way. Uh, so in comes the stapler, and we're just guiding the assistant um, to... And one thing I like you to do, you look at your video and look, again, I'm not being critical, but, but I am. Look how much wasted time there is. I mean, nothing's happened for, and this is an edited video, for 15 right. seconds. So, I mean, you, you want to go back and look at your videos and say, what the hell's going on here? And then that's how you get better, is to review these. All right, go ahead. Sure, I understand what you're saying. I think here um, we did find a large two branches of thoracic duct that we clipped. We're using these hemoclips that we actually uh, sort of came across during the um, the lab that you uh, sponsored us for. Um, mm -hmm. We hadn't been using those previously. We find that they're pretty good for larger vessels or ducts um, in this case. Um, and since we had identified it here, we don't specifically look for it. We decided to uh, clip it off. Um, 
it's amazing how well you can see the thoracic duct with the robot. You can see it on every single case. And so I don't particularly like these clips. I use the metallic clips, but, but those are fine. I just be careful with those on pulmonary artery branches. There's a lot of sad stories, so don't trust them for that. Okay, now you're cutting the esophagus above the azagus. Right, Good. so, right, exactly. So do, we, as said, we divide the azagus. We're using the... Um, uh, scissors with cautery applied to them to incise uh, the esophagus. Um, she had a distal tumor, so this margin is going to be fine. Um, mm. And uh, after um, uh, doing this, we'll bring up uh, the specimen and proceed with... Um, Why don't you have your anesthesiologist pull the NG tube back to about two or three inches proximal to where you cut. You can cut a lot faster that way. Yeah, we, I guess we usually pull it back afterwards. There it goes. And why don't you um, do it before? That, it's um, easier. It's easier to cut without mm. the damn thing in your way. And I caution you not <laughs> right. to use too much bovie there because you want to send that for margin. So I only bovie what's bleeding and try not to bovie that so the anesthesia, I mean, so the pathologist can ensure there's A, no Barrett's and no tumor there. But all right, you're going to use an EEA, it looks like. Okay. Yep. This is a 28 millimeter an anvil um, doing a double purse string um, using an ethamon suture around um, the cut edge of the esophagus. Um, Tell us what size needle. ethamon and um, what size needle. It's an RV needle and is it a 3.0 ethamon? What is it? That's a 2.0 oh. and a, yes, I think it's an RV needle um, and a uh, okay. uh, 15. And again, you're operating with one hand right now, which I just don't understand. I mean, grab the needle with your, well, not with the robotic arm three. Oh, mamma mia. Grab it with robotic arm two. Robotic arm three okay. should be holding and two should be working. Okay. All right. Yeah, I guess, you know, we're still still working on the suturing um, yeah, and but uh, trying to. You're, yeah. you're sewing with one hand. I mean, this this, this looks like a VAT surgeon. Needle driver so, in, in one, obviously. Yeah, what you want to do is put three where two is, and then one and two just sew the whole thing quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us tricks how you get your anvil in there. We've done 105 esophagectomies, and I've struggled getting the anvil in. Tell us how you got that anvil in, so, tricks to doing that. Right, so the bedside assistant brings it in on a grasper that... Um, uh, is uh, has a kind of angle on it. It is a laparoscopic instrument, and uh, the robotic arms hold the esophagus um, open. And it's it's a matter of getting kind of the right angle, and it's certainly not easy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think you know, making sure the we have the right size, um, making sure there's a little. Uh, it's almost a 30 degree um, kind of angle of the anvil on the end of the grasper that's being used to insert it in so that you can kind of clear um, yeah. uh, clear the well, mouth I'd, of the esophagus. And I'd love to see your video on that. I mean, you could teach us some stuff there. We're struggling on that, and uh, that sounds like you have a better way to do it than we do. So I'd love to see that part of your video maybe at a later date. But keep going. You're doing great. Sure. Sure. So we're going to come around under the anvil. This is actually the same as we do uh, things thoracoscopically, which is probably a, you know part of your point. But um, the, it's the same principles and just obviously being done in a, um, a different setting. Um, but the the goal there is to um, cinch the anvil in and uh, make sure that we'll have a complete rim of tissue so that when we um, staple the anastomosis, it's it's a, a <coughs> See, again here, it doesn't make sense to me. Take robotic arm three and grab the anvil and get it out of the way, and so with two and one. I mean, you're making this incredibly difficult. All you got to do is lift the anvil up with robotic arm three and move it. See how one hand, you haven't moved robotic arm two in this entire operation I've been watching. It's been, I mean, since you've okay. been sewing the anvil in. You should use all three arms actively. If you were doing that open, you'd never let that anvil sit there. You, you'd tell the resident, move the damn thing. I want to sew around it, right? Do that with the robot. Right. Right. No, that's there you, totally oh. true. you can't see me shaking my head, but I agree with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Sounds about right. But this is why we're reviewing people's videos now all over the country and doing video coaching because, and I'm hoping some people will do that with mine because there's always somebody out there that's going to look at what I'm doing and give me a better way to do it. Right. But, no, good point here, actually in trying to... Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Here you want three to grab the anvil and just lift the anvil up because three is posterior to two. And leave it posteriorly and then have two and one just so. And you'll sew that thing in about 40 seconds real fast. Got it. And then if you're me, they'll yeah, have thanks. an anastomotic leak later, but at least I did it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you in collecting the videos for this project and the, and the others. It's actually helped a lot to see what we're doing and to um, actually line out the steps and know it better for the next time. Um, yeah. So that's been a, a very helpful part of the, the fellowship. Um, uh, Ooh, this, oh, gosh, you skipped so many steps. Pause your video. You've got to pause the video. You, okay, you got to tell us. You, yeah. you, you got to tell us where you. No, no, a lot of things here. Where you opened up the stomach, how you brought the EEA in, um, where you put the anvil, in so it doesn't go through the aorta. I can show you some videos of that anvil going right through the aorta of some other surgeons, some of whom have sh shared this nationally. Good surgeon. So tell us all that. Right. So yeah. So sorry for having to edit to keep it in in ten minutes. But can you see this green arrow here? Uh, moving okay, uh, so the um, so it was a double uh, purse string around the anvil. Uh, once complete, then the um, conduit is incised on the anterior aspect um, with. I think we used uh, uh, the scissors again. Um, this is really important. Was it the distal end of the stomach that you incised? You just cut the staple off the distal end, or did you come down on the greater curvature side to put the anvil it in? Came down off. Yeah, it came down off the staple line. Um, each okay, surgeon's doing well, that just a little bit differently, but we're not just trimming off the end. Um, the it okay. creates basically, you know, an opening that, uh, just about the size of the EA stapler, and it is an important um, part of um, working with the two robot arms and the assistant to get the stapler uh, snugly into the conduit, and then okay, um, make sure to ahead, point, run, yeah, yeah, run your video. Sure to go ahead. Point the, anvil away. Yeah, okay, running the video again. Yep. Uh, the, the anvil's brought out of the end of the conduit. So what you, you may not see so well here is that this is the open portion where the yeah. um, stapler had been oh, it's, introduced. It's great. So you got to see your yeah, left hand here. I've yeah. ripped the stomach a few times with that right hand. You're doing a better job than me. I've torn that stomach doing that. So you're doing that very nicely. Keep going. Right. And so then um, join the stapler and the anvil and slowly um, uh, turning the handle to bring the two ends together. I, I would make uh, a note here. This pleura up here should all be incised. If you incise that pleura, you give yourself a lot more length. So that, in pleura, that pleura over the esophagus should be incised all the way up here where I'm pointing now. That will give you a lot more length in bringing that esophagus down. But go ahead. All right. So then, this is the last step. Basically, again, using the um, uh, stapler to close the opened portion of the conduit, and uh, finally, um, uh, we wrap an omental flap that was brought up with the conduit um, yes. around the anastomosis. And these are the the final few, sorry, sutures um, to do that. Great. Um, yeah. And uh, NG tube, um, one thing you didn't see there, NG tube was advanced, you know, passed into the conduit. Um, we leave two chest drains um, near the anastomosis. And, um, so I'll ask you two questions. Why do you use an NG tube? We stopped a few years ago. And why two drains? Why not one? And are you measuring amylase through the drains postoperatively? Right. Um, so NG tube for conduit decompression, um, we think it's an important part to relieve um, Attention is email on the staple line. Um, okay. and routine for thoracoscopic and uh, robot-assisted surgeries. Uh, chest drains, and um, you're right. We could probably leave one. We get the larger uh, actual chest tube out um, early, post up day one or two. But the leave a, um, a Blake drain or Jackson Pratt drain uh, near the anastomosis uh, to monitor for leak until. Uh, Swallowing is resumed. Yeah, short, uh, shorter answers, shorter answers, shorter answers. And amylase, yes or no, and why? Uh, we don't. Um, we, uh, we monitor for cle leaks clinically. Re read, read, read this month's annals. That would be my last point. Okay. Read this month's annals. So I learned something from that. When I went to that, I started using it, and I think it works. And there's an example of why I don't like the cardiac. I use a debakey in my left hand. I'm glad you left that in. If you use a robotic uh -huh. debakey in your left hand, it's got a lower profile, and that won't happen. Only wrap around the tip of an instrument, never around the jaws. 
This is good you left right. this in. Now, this is an honest surgeon. I like that. Leaving your mistakes, <laughs> that's how, that's how we learn. I minute 12 and was supposed to be stopped by now. Oh, okay, but, stop it. Great job. Yeah, well, listen, congratulations. How did how'd the patient do? She did great. Um, she um, uh, had uh, basically a swallow test. Um, the no, 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 just, just, just really she did fine. No leak and went home. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Better than our patients. Our esophagectomies haven't fared so well. That's excellent. Congratulations. All right. We've got about 20 minutes left, and we want some questions, so we're going to turn it over now uh, to Beth Israel, Deaconess, and have Jennifer Wilson. So first of all, thank you to the Graham Foundation for the opportunity to attend the training course to Dr. Serfolio and um, especially my mentor, Dr. Kent. So this is a uh, left upper lobectomy. Our robotic cases last year at Beth Israel were 30. Um, and this is just the thoracic cases. We mainly do um, lobectomies here and, as well as thymectomies. We don't really use the robot for any benign esophageal cases or for esophagectomies. I participated in 20 of those last year. Um, this year in 2015, the way our fellowship is set up is that I am on cardiac surgery for 11 months. So unfortunately, um, I was only able to scoot over to thoracic surgery for two cases. They were both lobectomies. Um, and the volume of robotic cases um, at the Israel has increased slightly. We had 40 cases. So our port placement actually changed after the course. Um, you can see here I've numbered the ports. Um, I'll use the screen arrow to show you. So the first port that we put in, well, first of all, we measure a centimeter off of the spine. That becomes our posterior assistant port, which is um, a five millimeter port. We measure 21 centimeters from the spine to get our camera port. And basically, right in the middle of that um, is another 8 millimeter robotic port. Um, anteriorly, we measure over again about um, 10 centimeters, and that becomes our anterior most port. And our assistant port um, is above the 11th rib down here. So the order of port placement that we do is we do a 5 millimeter port for this first anterior port. Um, Can I stop you right there? Let, let, let me stop you there. Don't put that port in first. You're going to end up in the belly in some people. Put the camera port in first the way I showed you at the course. It makes a difference. And I could tell you some sad stories. Okay. So put the camera in first. Put robotic on what you have labeled three, which really you should put C for camera. Put that port in first. You'll be much less likely to be in the abdomen. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for that. So we, we start out with a five millimeter here. We then um, place our assistant port under direct visualization, typically above the 11th rib, but as you said, the diaphragm is in a variable location, so we just want to be right above the diaphragm with that. We then move our VATS camera down to the second port, um, and we place all of our other ports um, under direct visualization. Yep, good. All right, so we can start the video. So my video is short, so I'm going to periodically pause it. Um, we start out by just dissecting out the inferior pulmonary ligament. Um, I'm showing a lot of nodal dissection because when you remove all the nodes, all of the hilar structures become very um, easy to divide, and it's good cancer surgery. So we start with and, station and I, and nine. I'm glad you're showing it because the last two videos didn't show me a lot of nodes, and I'm disappointed by that. But you can't show everything. I get it. But the nodes yeah, are critical. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, you can't show everything. So, so we divide the inferior pulmonary ligaments, uh, station nine. We then, um, you know, rotate the lung anteriorly and, and harvest station five and six here. You can see, obviously, avoiding the recurrent After you do nerve. nine, don't you do eight and seven next? You don't jump up to five and six. You go nine, eight, seven, don't you? You know, um, in this particular video, we did jump up. Um, but, so you, why, but you're why right. Would you, why would you do that? Does that sound efficient? Why wouldn't you do um, nine and then eight and seven? They're all lined up to be going a row. Be methodical. Yeah, we, right. So we kind of went inferiorly and then posteriorly, and then you'll see we go anteriorly. And I heard what you said. I just think about what I said. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here's more uh, nodal dissection here. Um, so here's a, we're working in the fissure. Um, pretty nice fissure. You can see there initially now as, as um, we're dissecting here, you can see it becomes a lot bloodier, um, harvesting some lymph nodes here as well. 
called that a 10, it's probably an 11. So here's just more, um, more dissection, exposing the PA. This is uh, completing the posterior fissure. That was divided. I think we probably could have done that in one load. It took two. Um, That's okay. Here's our anterior dissection. So you can see the phrenic nerve here, more <coughs> nodal harvest here anteriorly. You can see the pericardium there. Just One thing I like to do here is, is I like to reflect the left lower lobe back as well. So when I'm doing that, I can see the left lower lobe inferior pulmonary vein, the left upper lobe superior pulmonary vein. And I can see the space between the two. So I pin them up with my left hand so I can unequivocally see them because of the venous abnormalities on the left side. Then you can really plow through the fissure quickly and take out, let me steal your arrow, take out that lingular lymph node, that number 11, that great big giant lymph node that lives right on the lingular artery and the lingular bronchus. And once you take that out, then you can do a tunnel technique to complete your fissure. So it would be nice if you had your left lower lobe deflected more posteriorly. But, but go ahead, you're doing great. Yeah. All right. And then um, also in this case, it's a little bit unique because the uh, lesion, it was pretty small. We thought initially we could do an upper division. So you'll see that we actually dissected out more of the segmental anatomy. And we were a little bit inefficient because we ultimately determined that it would be best to do a lobectomy as opposed to a segmentectomy midway through the course of this. So you can see right here, this is the upper division vein, um, which we're dissecting out here. Careful, and just below careful it, pulling. Careful pulling on that vein. That's a little bit too much pull with your left hand. That's okay. better. But I wouldn't say that's inefficient. You try to do a segment, I give you credit for that. And sometimes when you go to do a segment, they turn into lobes, and that's just the way life is. So I wouldn't say that's inefficient if you plan to do a segment. I think that's just the nature of segmentectomies. Right, right. So this is after we divided the upper division uh, vein, again, taking out a uh, little bit more nodal tissue there as well. This is off the PA. So this is a, the post, more posterior PA branches here. So we're just creating a window um, to get our stapler around. So importantly here, I have robotic arm three holding the posterior segment posteriorly and my assist, if you leave it there for a second, so when I have this, robotic arm three is holding that way back like this, and I have robotic arm two will even hold the lower lobe down this way, and that makes the vector of this vessel, instead of like this, it runs like this. And then it's much easier to bring your stapler in and take it this way. So I think this is a really important teaching point that when people say the angles aren't right for the stapler or the porch, it's ridiculous. We as surgeons, create the angle. Instead of that vessel running this way, you can make that vessel run this way, and then it's much easier to take your stapler from the access port and <laughs> nail it. You're going to have to bring it in like this, and you're going to have to play with it a little bit. Let's see what happens. Go ahead, run your video. So I can see, see your point. See how you're coming to the aorta? Yeah. See how you're coming to the aorta? Yeah, in yes. my way, the aorta is not a, not a factor, but, but sometimes, right. you know, there's only so much you can do. Okay, go ahead. Um, all right, so here we're moving again back anteriorly. So this is the part that's you know just a little bit inefficient uh, getting around the um, right. PA here. I think you're doing a great job. Looks good to me. So sometimes you know using that vessel loop we found to be pretty helpful in terms of ex exposing um, the. Uh, vessel for the assistant at the bedside. We we don't have the fancy new robot with our own stapler, so you really do rely on the assistant at the bedside. And one thing that I've learned is that as the surgeon at the console, you really have to be cognizant, like you said, of setting up, um, you know, the person at the bedside so that they can staple safely. Um, well, so I agree a hundred percent. I think, and I have the same robot you do, so we use the vessel loop. And even when I use an XI, I like the vessel loop. So yeah, I, I think it's really nice. We've tried a variety of things, like a modified Foley catheter and those uh, those other stapler vessel leaders, but I think they can yeah. be a little bit bulky, and sometimes they, they seem to put a little torque on the um, yeah. vessel itself. So, you know, to be honest, I tend to like this vessel loop because it's so flexible, um, and it doesn't, Thank you. you know, yeah, it doesn't put any Thank torque you. on the vessel. I agree. I've had some visitors criticize me for the vessel loop, but I, I agree with you. Yeah, so we, we cut it to about 12 centimeters, and that seems to be a good length. Um, mm -hmm. All right, 
So here's the lingular PA, and you know we just divided the lingular vein there, so getting around that. And, and, and again, I want you to think of the conduct of your operation. Now, you started to do a segment, so it's different, yeah. but when you do a left upper lobe, the conduct is 987s, the 10 off the PA, the posterior fissure, the 5s and 6s, then it's lingula, left upper, left upper lobe vein, bronchus, and antiapical trunk, and that's the most efficient way, I think, to do it with an SI. And you're doing that a little differently here, and it's okay. But every you should have every operation in your mind an absolute conduct of order to do it to be efficient. But go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Are you sending frozens, by the way? Totally depends on the patient. If I don't want to operate on the guy and I couldn't get out of it pre-op, I send frozens on everything to get out of it. But in general, once you get to the OR, you want to resect them. So no, would you? Right. No, we we don't typically. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Go ahead. Um, so that's just dividing the lingular PA, kind of cut that out. And then uh, last is the bronchus here. So you can see here we're kind of creating that angle maybe perhaps that you were describing where we're lifting it up and away from the... Um, and I actually go, go back to that for a minute. I would have put your anvil the other direction, and I would have the whole lung lifted up so you could watch it. Bring your, bring your stapler on the bronchus. We don't need to see the bagging. We all know how to do that. Show us where your stapler. See? Uh -huh. I would hold the lung up differently when I do the bronchus, and I'd have my anvil on this side, the anterior side, bringing in your anvils on the other side. Okay. Does it matter? Maybe, because I like to have this, the anvil near the vessel so I can see over it better. See, you could potentially injure the vessel there, but probably not. Okay. okay. Excellent. How'd the patient do? Very well. Yep, so All we, right, we'll you know, yeah, we just bag it, we leave a Blake drain, we typically remove that on post-op day one, and then we send them home as soon as we can. So at the wow, earliest... Wow, use a Blake two. drain. You're not using a chest tube, using a Blake? Correct. Yep. Wow, good for you. You haven't had yeah, problems where if the air leaks are big, the Blake can't take all the air out? You know, um, we have not. Um, they seem to be, you know, good really, really solid drains. I would say that, you know, also we pay extra attention to stripping our chest tubes. So every morning on rounds, every patient has their chest tube stripped. So maybe they require a little bit more maintenance. Um, but that's so just I, objective. But so what I would say is I, I, I'm not a stripper, and I don't want to strip in the morning, night, the afternoon. So I use a 20 French. There is data that the Blake drain doesn't drain big air leaks. There's and more sub-Q air, but if it's working for you, that, that's okay. I think smaller drains are better, so I like the idea. All right, good. Thank you. All right, we have time for questions, and we have a lot of uh, really good surgeons on here, and I'd like to hear from them as to, for the attendings here, did the course make you a better teacher? Because that really was a primary objective of mine. I didn't tell anybody that, but I really wanted the course to make the attendings a better teacher. Maybe they can comment on that or on anything else they want to. So does anybody out there have any questions? Mike Kent is, is just in his office right across the hall, and he popped over here a little bit earlier, and he wanted to get your opinion on the robotic plastic clips. Yes. So I don't like them, um, and that's an opinion without data. Now, I know from talking to surgeons at least uh, six surgeons have had problems with those WEC. They're called WEC clips on pulmonary arteries. One was discovered post-op in the recovery room, and that was a disaster. Patient lived, but put out a liter and a half of blood, and when they went back, the wet clip slipped off. And I think it's because the wet clips are great for systemic arteries. The kidney surgeons use them on renal arteries. Uh, the urologists use them on arteries. But on the pulmonary artery, unless you cut it really long where it's past the clip, it's really easy for that pulmonary artery to come off. The other thing is sponges get stuck on them. So I don't use the wet clip at all unless I'm forced to when I'm proctoring somebody who wants to. I like the 8 millimeter robotic clips, or I prefer staples, and I'll staple everything best I can. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. So the other question Mike Kent had was, um, when, you, when there have been aortic injuries with the, ro with the um, esophagectomies, was it the anvil on the esophageal side or the gastric side that punctured the aorta? No, it, well, again, these are from surgeons. One surgeon told me about it. Another surgeon actually showed a video of it happening. Uh, and both times it was the anvil going into the aorta. The one surgeon, a very, very good minimally invasive surgeon, treated minimally invasively. 
and just no. used glue on the aorta. <laughs> and I'm not, he never got an aneurysm, just glued it, held pressure, and it did well. The other surgeon opened and fixed it with a suture. Both patients did okay, but I will tell you, you know, when you see those videos, it gets your attention, and, uh, and I'm very worried when I've done it, and I've done a lot of EEAs, that that anvil is very close to the aorta when I do it. I watched your video. You guys were doing it a little different angle and better than me, and I may steal the way you were doing it to have that anvil way above um, the aorta. So that was nice the way you showed it. Oh, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm getting the two questions. The first question was, because uh, I thought everybody could hear that, my fault. The first question is, what do I think about the wet clips? Do we like them? And I think I told you I don't. The second mm -hmm. question was, uh, the injuries to the aorta from the anvil, how did they happen and how were they handled? And then we have a question from Johannes. Johannes, thanks for the fellows who presented. Was your first case as a surgeon a lobectomy, esophagectomy, or did you start off with an easier case? So ladies, would you answer Johannes' question from California? I thought one of the best um, cases to do was a mediastinal lymph node dissection. I don't remember the exact details of why we had that case, but probably someone who was um, coming for diagnosis and couldn't achieve it some other way, and that was a great case to to yeah, start but I would say every case has a level one case in it. Let's say you're doing a sleeve left upper lobectomy of a radiated patient on chemo and steroids. That's a level one case. Putting the ports in is level one. Taking the nodes out is level one. Taking the ligament down is level one. Taking out the subcranial lymph nodes is a level two case. But it's all the same patient in the same case. And that's the way you should look at it as teachers and as fellows. That was one of the questions I had, is if you had suggestions for us as learners and then our attendings as teachers regarding how to um, start, how to um, make in, you know, yeah. improvements to the next level and so on. So I have a paper hopefully coming out soon. We're about to submit it to the annals, about which recorded how I taught lobectomy. And it's, it's been something I've been doing for three or four years. It's a sheet I fill out at the end of the operation. And it shows I used to have 20 or 30 things. Now I'm just down to 18, 18 steps. And if the resident completed it or not. So it's not, you know, you guys record whether you're the surgeon or not. I'm being much more granular. Did you put the ports in? Did you take the ligament down? Did you take out the nine? The eight? Oh, you didn't do the sevens? Why? And then I go back and look at why my results were so terrible in the, um, in the initial part of my first 100 lobes, even my second 100, my second 100 lobes lobes 100 to 200, the residents and fellows weren't completing parts of the operation. Part of it is I wasn't letting them. Part of it is I didn't have the time or the patience. But the big thing is I hadn't looked at videos and learned how to be a better teacher. And so I really encourage the attendings to record. Just the act of recording something makes you better. Record what part of the operations you were teaching well and what part of the operation you didn't teach well and define teaching well as the resident was able to complete it. I know some residents are better than others, some patients are easier than others, but if you try to eliminate those factors and just look at completing it or not, you'll get better at teaching it. All right, other questions? Thank I would you. say to, um, to expand on that uh, question from, uh, from Johannes Kratz, I started out in general surgery. I think the first case that I did was a Heller myotomy or a Nissen fundoplication, um, just doing portions of that. And that was actually really helpful because I got practice suturing robotically, which was profoundly easier than laparoscopically or thoracoscopically. So I did start out with, you know, they were the thoracic surgeons doing those cases, but it was more of an ab abdominal case before I moved on to doing lung cases. And the other case that I think is good um, in certain parts are thymectomies. You know, obviously you have to be careful of the phrenic and you have the venous branches from the innominate vein. Um, but a lot of that dissection, you know, I think it's it can be really nice and there's a good plane and, um, you know, you, you sort of get used to, to being in the chest that way. I think you're right. And I, I think, you know, a thymectomy is not a level one case. Some lobes are easier than thymectomies. Getting the horns out of the uh, upper part of the neck and medius thymus can be very difficult. If you put your left hand, if you're in the right chest and you put robotic arm two too high, the anominate, excuse me, the mammary vein where it empties into the cava gets in your way of your left hand getting in the chest. And that's the big mistake surgeons make. They put all three of their instruments too high and they should be much lower <coughs> actually in the chest. 
So robotic arm two can get around the right mammary vein, or if you're in the left chest, robotic arm one gets below the left mammary vein, and you can get up into the neck. Otherwise, you'll have a real problem with that vein, and it's port placement. It's all port placement contingent. Do you have a preference, right or left chest? For thymectomies. So in general, if it's midline, I prefer right. We did uh, two thymectomies yesterday. We did them both from the right, even though one of the tumors, it was small, it was only four centimeters, it was a little bit in the left chest. It's much easier to be in the right because the heart's not in the way. You mm -hmm. never have to worry about putting your left hand into the heart uh, when you're in the right chest like you can from the left. So I really prefer the right, and I feel strongly that's safer. However, you know, they can be done safely from both sides. Mm-hmm. Okay, any other questions? Well, again, I want to thank Intuitive. I want to thank the Graham Foundation. I want to thank Kaylee for helping set this up. Uh, and really, of course, we have to thank our, our three ladies, Dr. Gillespie, Dr. Modi, and Dr. Wilson. You guys really did a great job. These were great videos, very, very well done. Don't let me annoy you. I'm just trying to take every opportunity to teach and to get us better. So I appreciate everybody's attention, and if there's no other comments. Uh, I don't know, Kaylee, you want to sign off or you want me to sign off? Let's see if she's on. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Cifolio. And uh, again, just thank you everyone for participating. We're very thrilled with uh, how great of a presentation this was and we're very excited with the showing. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. God bless you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.